Good morning and welcome to worship on this fourth Sunday in Lent. Before we begin worship, I'd like to ask Marilyn Biddle to share with us some announcements. Good morning. Thank you for joining us for worship on this fourth Sunday in Lent. Glad to see you all turn your clocks ahead. Please not, please try not to catch up on your lost hour of sleep during the sermon. If you need to visit the church building this week for any reason, please wear a mask for everyone's protection. Please join us for community connection at two o'clock on Tuesday on Zoom. The link can be found on our website. Our reading of Fratelli Tutti by Pope Francis will resume on Wednesday at 10 a.m. Everyone is invited to participate, even if you haven't already done so. It's a good, thoughtful discussion. LSS is putting together Easter bags for the families they serve. If you would like to contribute to the materials they need for those bags, you can do so through Gloria Day's holiday fund. You can make a contribution on our website. Faye Esperanza will also be putting together Easter bags for their children, and we are invited to contribute funds for that as well, which you can do also on our website. Also, if you would like to participate in ELCA's 40 Days of Giving, you can find links for that on the ELCA website, www.elca.org. Joy's this week, Galen Anderson's birthday is on Wednesday, the 17th, which is St. Patrick's Day. Chris Wacker is birthday is on the 19th, Friday, and Mark Engels birthday is on on Saturday the 20th. For those of you using Zoom, you can use the chat button at the bottom of your screen to submit prayer requests for the prayers of intercession. And please don't forget to send in your ties and pledges and offerings or you could do so on our website. Thank you. Let's prepare our hearts for worship with a brief order of confession and forgiveness, which have been recorded this week on video. Have mercy, 
Let's join in singing our gathering song, God Loved the World. The prayer of the day, the Lord be with you. Let us pray. O oh God, rich in mercy, by the humiliation of your son, you lifted up this fallen world and rescued us from the hopelessness of death. Lead us into your light, that all our deeds may reflect your love. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen.
The first reading this morning is from Numbers 21. The Israelites left Mount Hor by the road that leads to the Gulf of Abaqua in order to go around the territory of Edom. But on the way, the people lost their patience and spoke against God and Moses. They complained, why did you bring us out of Egypt to die in this desert where there is no food or water? We can't stand any more of this miserable food. Then the Lord sent poisonous snakes among the people and many Israelites were bitten and died. The people came to Moses and said, we sinned when we spoke against the Lord and against you. Now pray to the Lord to take these snakes away. So Moses prayed for the people. Then the Lord told Moses to make a metal snake and put it on a pole so that anyone who was bitten could look at it and be healed. So Moses made a bronze snake and put it on a pole. Anyone who had been bitten would look at the bronze snake and be healed. Word of wisdom, word of life. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. <clears throat> the second lesson is, is from Ephesians 2. You were dead, the trespasses of sin in which you once lived, following the course of this world, following the ruler of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work among those who are disobedient. All of us once lived among them in the passions of our flesh, following the desires of flesh and senses. And we were by nature children of wrath, like everyone else. But God, who is rich in mercy and out of great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead through our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the ages to come, he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace, you have been saved through faith. And this is not by your own doing. It is the gift of God, not the result of works, so that anyone may boast. For we are what he has made us, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand to be our way of life. Word of wisdom, word of life. Thanks. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel according to John, the third chapter, beginning at the 14th verse. As Moses lifted up the bronze snake on a pole in the desert, in the same way the Son of Man must be lifted up, so that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. For God loved the world so much that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not die, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to be its judge, but to be its Savior. Those who believe in the Son are not judged, but those who do not believe have been judged already because they have not believed in God's only Son. This is how the judgment works. The light has come into the world, but people love the darkness rather than the light because their deeds are evil. Those who do evil things hate the light and will not come to the light because they do not want their evil deeds to be shown up. But those who do what is true come to the light in order that the light may show that what they did was in obedience to God. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. And now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O God my Redeemer, and my Rock. Amen. Such an interesting story in the book of Numbers. The people of Israel are on the road between Mount Hor and the Gulf of Aqaba. They're complaining again. They're not happy with the food. It's always something. 
Anyway, the people grumbled, so the Lord sent poisonous snakes among them, and many Israelites were bitten and died. That's how the Israelites tell the story. Nobody ever tells the story from the snake's point of view, the way they see it. They were just all hanging about, minding their own snaky business in snake land, when suddenly the whole nation of Israel showed up with all their noisy grumbling and complaints and pitched camp right on top of them, driving tent pigs down into their dens, breaking their eggs, chasing them with sticks, throwing rocks at them, hacking at them with swords. So yeah, they bit a few of them. They were just trying to defend themselves. They weren't trying to kill anybody. Why would they? The Israelites were too big to eat, at least for those kinds of snakes. Moses prayed to the Lord to make the snakes go away. Maybe the leader of the snakes asked the Lord to make the people go away. Maybe the leader of the snakes suggested that the Lord could tell Moses to put a big bronze snake up on the pole to remind the people that they were in snake territory and that the snakes were there first, thank you very much. So they should be careful where they were poking around and pitching their tents. Well, that's not the way we get the story in the book of Numbers, but then snakes never were any good at public relations, and they don't come off too well in the Bible as a rule. Still, it's interesting that in this particular instance, even in the Moses version of the story, God is using the snakes to accomplish God's business. And that includes healing cranky, ungrateful people from snake bite, which they wouldn't have got bit in the first place if they hadn't been cranky and ungrateful and gone poking around looking for something else to eat when there wasn't anything kosher out there anyway. So the moral of the story is be grateful for what you have, even if you're a little tired of it, and leave the snakes alone. Many, 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 many years later, this story would come up again when Jesus sat down one night with a Pharisee named Nicodemus. Jesus was trying to help Nicodemus understand some very basic things about living in the love of God. This was difficult for Nicodemus because he was a very smart and knowledgeable person, a teacher, in fact. He knew the sacred writings of Israel backward and forward and upside down. But the things Jesus was saying mystified him. He had a lot to unlearn. The way he understood things got in the way of him comprehending things, if you grasp what I'm saying. Jesus was trying to help Nicodemus learn how to see and enter and experience the kingdom of God. Nicodemus was trying to get his head around it when he needed to put his whole heart into it. Nicodemus needed another pathway into the mystery. It's like this, said Jesus. Remember when Moses lifted up that bronze snake in the wilderness? It's like that. The human one will also be lifted up. And in the same way the people were healed when they looked at that bronze snake gleaming in the sun, they'll be healed when they look to the human one, only they'll be healed of something much more deadly than snake venom. Have you ever wondered what kind of magic was at work in that bronze snake on that pole in the desert? It was a powerful magic, stronger than any other. When people looked at that snake on the pole, the light flashing off of it pierced their hearts and reminded them that they'd complained against Moses and against God. They'd been in a desert, in a land of no food and no water, and God had provided for them. But they were ungrateful. There was poison in their hearts, and it came out in their words. The snakes biting them was a kind of living metaphor for the way they'd been treating each other and Moses, and God. When they looked at that bronze snake glinting in the desert sun, they could see a very unflattering image of themselves. They could taste the bitterness of their ingratitude and the venom of their complaining. So they repented, and they were healed, because they also saw that God loved them enough to transform them. They could stop being snakes, metaphorical or otherwise. 
the magic, the power that emanated from that snake on the pole was God's forgiveness and God's love. And now the whole world is snake bitten, Nicodemus. People believe they're walking always and everywhere under the dark night of God's judgment. They don't see that they've been always and everywhere in the bright light of God's love. They're perishing. Their souls are dying because they can't let themselves believe they're loved. Listen, Nicodemus, God loves the world so much that God has given God's only Son so that whoever believes him won't perish, won't fade into an everlasting death and nothingness, but will instead live forever in the light of God's love. You think God is about judgment? I'll tell you about judgment. God wants to bring everyone and everything, even the snakes, into the light of God's love. But some don't want to come. Some want to stay in the dark. Some want to keep living in the deep shadows of hatred and fear and us versus them. Some have a greedy hunger in them that wouldn't be satisfied if they swallowed the whole earth. Some think they are the whole earth and don't have room in their hearts for anything or anyone else. They think they're all that in a bag of chips. Some, many really, want to keep judging others because it's the only way they can make themselves feel like they have any value. So they just keep living in the shadow of judgment and the shadow of their own fears. But the Son of God is not here to judge. The Son came to heal, to save, to lead people out of the shadows. The world has forgotten how lovely it is. The Son of God has come to help the world remember, to relearn its beauty and its kindness. The world has forgotten that when God created everything, God said it was good. All of it, everyone, even the snakes. The Son of God has come to help people remember original goodness. When they see the human one lifted up, they'll be reminded of all the ugly things that happen in a snake bit world. They'll be reminded of how the venom in their own hearts and souls can wound and kill. And then they will remember that they weren't made that way. Then they will see the love of God. They will see that the sun came out of love, not out of need. And the love of God will transform them. They will step back into the light of God's love. And all of that is what Jesus was trying to get Nicodemus to understand, and us. It's what he would like us to understand, too. When you think about it, all of this is about disruption. The Israelites disrupt the generally sleepy life of the snakes when they pitch camp in their territory. The snakes disrupt the grumbly and quarrelsome life of the Israelites when they start biting them. God and Moses disrupt the poisonous dynamics of fear and dissatisfaction when they set up the snake on a pole. Nicodemus disrupts Jesus' quiet evening when he drops by at night for a private interview. In his conversation with Nicodemus, Jesus disrupts our understanding of theology and the scriptures especially our understanding of how judgment works. God works through disruptions to transform things and people. This week we observed the anniversary of two significant disruptions. Wednesday, March 10th, was the 88th anniversary of the Long Beach earthquake of 1933. Between 115 to 120 people were killed 
damage was estimated at $40 million. That would be more than 800 million today. 230 school buildings were either destroyed or declared unsafe for use. Out of that disruption though, came new standards for building safety, including specific codes for school buildings, new methods of government assistance for disaster response and reconstruction were instituted too. As people realized that these kinds of resources were needed when damage was too widespread or extensive to expect a city to be able to recover and rebuild on its own. Essentially, we found new ways to take care of each other, to love each other. The other anniversary is one we're all too aware of. It's been one year since we were all in church together, worshiping in our sanctuary, our building, but we've never stopped being church. The disruption of this pandemic has made being church more difficult in some ways, but it has also transformed us in some important ways too. Like all disruptions, it has taught us more about who we are and invited us to think about who we want to be, who we're called to be as we move forward. The Israelites weren't the same people when they left the land of the snakes. They complained less and were more grateful. Life as usual had been disrupted. Nicodemus wasn't the same person when the sun rose the next morning as he was when he had sat down with Jesus in the dark of the night before. He'd begun to understand both God's love and God's judgment differently. Everything he knew, everything he understood had been disrupted. You might say he was being reborn. We aren't the same people we were a year ago. All the patterns of our lives have been disrupted. In a time when we need, when need and circumstances required us to stay physically apart, you would think we would have made every effort to find ways to pull together. But all too often as a nation, at least, we let the polarity of our dysfunctional politics pull us farther apart. We've seen the damage caused by the venom of our fears and anger. But we've also heard the voice of Christ calling us together and helping us relearn our loveliness, reminding us of our original goodness. We have seen the serpent lifted up in the desert, but also the cross lifted at Calvary. Through earthquake or pandemic, polar vortex or politics, even snakes, God's love still flows to carry us through it all together in Jesus' name. Growing in faith, lifted by hope, guided by love and relying on the promises of God, we pray boldly for the church, the world, and all people in need. Loving God, you sent your son that the world might be saved through him. Inspire the witness of the church throughout the world. Empower missionaries, Bible translators, and ministries of service in your name. Bless our partners in ministry, especially Lutheran Social Services, Fei Esperanza, South Coast Interfaith Council, our ELCA Global Partner Churches, and young adults in global mission. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our prayer. Holy One, from east to west, your steadfast love is shown. Nourish seas and deserts, wilderness areas and cities. Give water to thirsty lands. Nurture spring growth that feeds hungry creatures. Bless farmers as they prepare for the growing season. We thank you for the blessing of rain this week. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. 
you sustained your people in the wilderness. Give courage to all who lead in times of crisis and scarce resources. Prosper the work of those who aid victims of famine and drought and bring peace in places where scarce resources cause violence. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. By grace, we have been saved. Fill this congregation to overflowing with that grace that we show mercy to others. Nourish any in our midst who are hungry, especially children, and bless our ministries of feeding and shelter, especially our partnership with Fei Esperanza. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Loving God, your mercy endures forever. Deliver all who cry to you, especially those who are hungry or without homes. Give life in places where death seems triumphant. Give healing to those who are sick and comfort to those who mourn. We pray for Charlie Hartwell, Margie's son-in-law with Bell's palsy. We pray for Mike Engel, Dina DiMombro, Janet Sims, Vicki Gammer, Jim Shoup, Diane Kyle, Judy Mello, Dee Peretta, Renee Wright, and for Lynn Kicks. We pray for all who are grieving and for all those on the prayer wall. Reveal your power to heal and to save. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our prayer. Your son was lifted up that whoever believes might have eternal life. As we raise our prayers to you, we are mindful of the communion of saints who gather and pray with us, especially those from this family of faith who have so recently become part of the cloud of witnesses. Bring us with all the saints into the fullness of your promises. We entrust our prayers to you, spoken or silent, for the sake of the one who dwells among us, your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who taught us to pray. for 
Let's join in singing our sending song, By Grace We Have Been Saved. May the Lord bless us and keep us. May the Lord's face shine on us and may the Lord be gracious to us. May the Lord look upon us with favor and help us remember our original goodness, our original loveliness. And as we live into that loveliness and goodness, may we know the grace of God and move in peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve each other, to love and serve your neighbors, to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.